Now you're lucky enough to own a car like me. Well, maybe not just like me because this car is probably older than most of the people watching this video, but if you own a car and you live in a cold weather environment like I do, what you're going to start to notice is when the weather starts to turn colder, your tires need a fill up. That is, they start to become a little flat. Now obviously this is associated with the decrease in the surrounding temperature, but what relationship does temperature have to the volume of my tires? Hmm. Hmm. Now as we come to explain gases and the behavior of those gases, we have to understand three properties of gases. And those three properties are pressure, temperature, and volume. Now if you remember in the previous vodcast, we've already sort of talked about pressure and the idea that pressure as it relates to gases is just the number of collisions that the gas exerts against its container or other gases. The temperature of a system is really just the average kinetic energy or the speed of those particles. The higher the temperature of the gas, the faster those particles are going to move around. The lower the temperature of the gas, the slower the particles are going to move around. And volume is really just the amount of space that a gas occupies. And what we have to remember with volume and what we have to remember with gases is that gases will occupy the entire volume of their container. So if we know the volume of the container, by extension, we know the volume of the gas. And as we're dealing with these different properties of gases, we have to understand the units that are associated with them. And I think the easiest one to start with is probably volume, because most of the time we're going to be dealing with volume in liters. Now sometimes you might get it expressed in cubic centimeters or milliliters, but you're typically going to have to convert into liters before we do any calculations or manipulations with volume of gases. The other one that we can take a look at, and we've already discussed, is pressure. Now pressure we can measure in a whole bunch of different units, and we have to understand the equivalence between each one of them. But typically we're going to be measuring a pressure in kilopascals. But we can also see it, as we saw in the previous video, that using a barometer, we sometimes could see it in millimeters of mercury. We sometimes could see it in um, pounds per square inch, or we could sometimes see it in atmospheres. Now you have to be able to know how to convert between each one of these pressure units and so it's understood that one atmosphere of pressure is equal to 14.7 pounds per square inch which is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury, sometimes called TOR or referred to as TOR, and we have 101.3 kilopascals. But again, we talked about this in a previous vodcast. The one thing that we really are going to have to focus on though is temperature. You see, temperature for most of us, depending on whether you're Canadian or American or anywhere else in the world, you could have different temperature units. So here in Canada we use degrees Celsius, but uh, if you're in the United States you might be using Fahrenheit. Either way, neither one of these are what we're going to use to establish the relationships in gas laws, at least the ones involving temperature. We have to convert to the absolute temperature scale. That is, we have to convert to a unit called Kelvin. And the way that we do this is based on the absolute temperature scale, which again is based on the motion of these particles. At zero Kelvin, that is when all particles stop moving. So again, if we're going to measure the average kinetic energy, and that by extension is how we measure temperature, if the particles aren't moving, then it has, they have a value of zero, and that's the absolute temperature scale. Now the way that we convert between that is that we understand that absolute zero occurs at approximately minus 273 degrees Celsius. So if you're given a value, if you're measuring value using a thermometer in degrees Celsius, in order to convert to Kelvin, we have to add 273. So that zero degrees Celsius would be 273 Kelvin. And if we want to conversely convert from Kelvin to degrees Celsius, we're going to have to subtract 273. So in order to explain what's happening to my tires in winter, Let's take a look at the relationship that exists between pressure, volume, and temperature of a gas. And I think probably the easiest way to visualize this is to use something that we've all had exposure to over some course of our life, and that is a balloon. Now, let's take a look at the relationship that I think most of us can relate to, and that is the relationship that exists between pressure and temperature of a gas. And if we just think about this, I think for most people it probably makes sense. If we talk about the temperature of a gas, that is, as a gas speeds up or the average kinetic energy of those molecules starts to increase, the speed at which those particles are going to move around are going to start to increase. The number of collisions that they have against each other and against the side of the container are going to increase. And as a result, the pressure is going to increase. So this is what's referred to as Hamilton's Law. That is, the 
pressure of a gas is proportional to the temperature of the gas. So we have a direct relationship between the pressure of the gas and the temperature of the gas. As the temperature of the gas goes up, the particles start to move faster, there's more and more collisions, and the pressure goes up. As the temperature decreases, we see a resultant slowing of these particles, reducing the number of collisions and reducing the overall pressure of that container. And so what we have here is a relationship now between the pressure and the temperature of the gas. Now it's important to note that in all of these relationships we're always holding everything else constant. So the amount of gas stays constant, the volume of this gas stays constant, so the only thing that's changing is one of the pressure or the temperature and we're evaluating the relationship or the change in the other variable. So again, Amundsen's law states that the pressure of a gas is proportional to its temperature and we can see that those two variables are directly related. Well, let's take a look at another relationship that exists between gases, and this one is volume and temperature. So remember, this time, we're going to hold everything else constant, but we're going to hold pressure constant. So pressure being held constant, we're just going to take a look at the relationship that exists between volume and temperature. And this is a relationship known as Charles' Law. And Charles' Law states that the volume of a gas is proportional to the temperature. So as the temperature increases, the kinetic energy of these particles starts to increase. And as long as our pressure remains constant, we will notice that the volume of that container starts to increase. And again, this is a direct relationship. As one variable goes up, the other variable goes up as well. So we have two remaining variables that we've yet to take a look at, and that is pressure and volume and the relationship that exists between those two. Now this is not always as easy a relationship to understand as the previous two. The previous two were direct relationships. As one variable went up, the other one went up as well. This is what we refer to as an inverse relationship. In fact, there's an inverse relationship between pressure and volume of a gas, and this is stated in Boyle's Law, that the relationship between pressure and volume is inversely proportional. So as pressure goes up, the volume is going to go down, or vice versa. Now we have to consider again that temperature is held constant. So the speed of the particles are going to be moving at the same speed on average. Remember, temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of those particles. So if it's constant, the speed of the particles are constant. So let's think about this relationship. If we were to expand the size of the container, increase the volume of that container, but the particles were moving at the same speed, they would have to cover more space, and so the collisions against the side of that container would decrease. Hence, the inverse relationship that exists between pressure and volume, and that is Boyle's Law. Now, there is one more relationship that we're going to take a look at, so I don't want you to memorize each and every one of these. In fact, what I would like you to know is the combination of all three, and it's aptly named the Combined Gas Law, and it takes into account pressure, volume, and temperature, and all of the relationships that exist between them. So it keeps in mind that pressure and temperature and volume and temperature are directly related, and that pressure and volume are inversely related, and it puts them all into the following equation. P1V1 over T1 equals P2V2 over T2. Now, you don't have to remember all of the individual gas law equations. You don't have to remember Edmonton's Law, Charles' Law, and Boyle's Law, as well as the combined gas law, because if you just know the combined gas law, and you understand that for each of these other relationships, all we have to do is hold another variable, or at least one of the variables, constant, we can use this combined gas law in order to derive every other one of the gas laws. So for example, if we want to use Boyle's Law, in which pressure and volume are being established, we can just cover up temperature, and there's the equation for Boyle's Law. Or if we want to deal with Charles' Law, we can cover up pressure, and here we have the relationship now, the direct relationship between volume and temperature, that we can now evaluate. And if we have a situation in which none of these variables are held constant, and we're trying to figure out the pressure of a system when the volume and temperature change, then we can use the combined gas law and arrive at that answer. Now keep in mind when you're going through this calculation that you have to use the appropriate units. Your volume units have to be the same, your temperature units have to be the same, and they have to be in Kelvin using that absolute temperature scale, so know your conversions, and you have to have your pressure units the same. And it doesn't matter, you don't have to have it in kilopascals in this case, you're just trying to evaluate pressure, so as long as your pressure units are the same, then you're okay in going through this calculation. So hopefully now you have a better understanding of the relationships that exist, not only qualitatively, but quantitatively, that is using equations between pressure, volume, and temperature. But how does that help us explain what happens to those tires in winter? Well, if we think about what goes on in winter, 
That is, we're at a lower temperature, and usually our cars are outside for at least part of the day. The tire temperature starts to decrease, and the gas inside that tire and its temperature starts to decrease as well. So we know what happens to the speed of those gas molecules, those gas particles, as the temperature starts to decrease. They start to slow down. And as they start to slow down, I think you know what's going to happen to the number of collisions against the side of that, that tire. It's going to start to decrease. We can think about a couple of relationships here between temperature and volume and temperature and pressure, and both of those can be applicable here. As the number of collisions goes down, the pressure is going to go down. So if you're going to take a pressure reading, you're going to notice that you have fewer PSI in your tire, even though the amount of air probably hasn't changed, unless you've got a leak, you might want to get that checked. But it is going to decrease. Now in terms of the volume, we have the same sort of relationship here, where as the temperature decreases, our volume decreases as well. And so we're going to start to see that tire start to look maybe a little flatter. So now that you have taken a look at these gas laws and the relationships that exist between pressure, volume, and temperature, maybe you have a better idea as to why you have to pump up those tires a little bit more every winter. Thanks for watching. Oh, you're still here. Okay. Um, I, was, I, was, I thought we were done. I was going to leave. But if, if you're still here, why don't we try one of these calculations? So a sample of helium, that's a gas, has a volume of 0 0.180 liters a pressure of 0 0.800 atmospheres, and a temperature of 29.0 degrees Celsius. Yes, there's a reason why I enunciated and paused the degrees Celsius. Think about it. Now let's say we take this same gas and we change a couple of those conditions. That is, we change the volume to 90.0 milliliters, and the pressure changes to 324.16 kilopascals. What I want you to figure out is what is the new temperature of that gas going to be in degrees Celsius? So pause the video right now and see if you can go through this calculation using your combined gas law. Keep in mind that I've given you all three variables here. So the only thing that's really held constant is the amount of gas. So pressure, volume, and temperature have to all be considered in this calculation. So let's see if you can go through this calculation and the answer that you get. You press pause, right? Okay. So now if you've figured it out, I'm going to give you some choices over here. And yes, you can click on them. Go, go ahead, click on the one that you think is correct. Now, 